extended family reunion at my house and I was out of antiperspirant. So I used my husband's suave. After a day of keeping names straight and Uncle George's plate full, I was about finished. But suave wasn't. It kept me really cool and dry. And since I knew suave was less expensive, I switched. Who'd have believed something that worked so well could cost so little? Who'd have believed Uncle George could eat so much? Suave had a perspirant. So effective, you won't believe the price. Introducing a new Chex that's double delicious. I, I love, love, double, double Chex. Chex better, better than, than the, the rest of us. Corn, corn, rice, rice, sweet, sweet, crunch, crunch, double, double, crisp, crisp, bite, bite, munch, munch. It's new, lightly sweetened corn plus lightly sweetened rice makes new double Chex twice as nice. I, I love, love, double, double Chex. Chex better, better than, than the, the rest of us. Corn, corn, rice, rice, sweet, sweet, sweet crunch, crunch, double, double, crisp, crisp, bite, bite, bite. In a world no bigger than the sandbox, no deeper than the mud between toes, it's spray and wash that has gotten out the food, grease, and grass the little ones get into more than any other stain remover ever made. And that has given more mothers the quiet strength to send them back out into that little world to do it all over again. More than any other stain remover, spray and wash gets out what America gets into. For great Halloween fun, pick up some spooky decorations at Walgreens. Just $7.99 each. Scary sound-activated Halloween figures, battery-operated pirate skull, witches, skeletons, and more. Stock up on Halloween candy, too. Walgreens has a wide selection of treats and goodies of all kinds. And it's time to order your holiday photo greeting cards. Put your favorite photo on any of six beautiful designs. All orders include a free marker pen. Treat yourself to savings this week at Walgreens. Thirty years ago, people rushed home thinking the world might be coming to an end. It almost did. Khrushchev, Kennedy, Castro, communication breakdown. One step away from blowing up the world. They were all gung-ho, ready, ready. I thought I might never live to see another Saturday night. Peter Jennings, the missiles of October. What the world didn't know. An ABC News special. Guest accommodations provided by Disney's Village Resort, where you'll find enchanting treehouses, villas, and suites in a village setting, all at the Walt Disney World Resort. All right. Thank you. Welcome back. And first, the very important tiebreaker. Our studio audience voted by secret ballot. Now, you know that you folks are already, your motto is already in the semifinals. You got that $5,000? Did we give you that in the end yet? Oh, we will. It's all right. Oh, trust us, we will. All right. all right. Now, let's see what happens. It's between Yamato or Sparkle times three. The audience has decided it's Sparkle times three. Congratulations, girls. Okay. See you in the semifinals. In the semifinals. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, girls. Thank you. Oh, you're terrific. All right. Oh, you want to give me a hug? Okay. All right. You want to give me a hug? All right. And now, the male vocalist tiebreaker. Our studio audience voted by secret ballot, our champion Tom Burns, challenger Dave Russell. The audience has voted and says, new champion Dave Russell. Tom, wait a minute, guys. I want to say something. Tom is already in the semifinals, so we'll see you then. Congratulations, we'll see you in the semifinals. We'll see you next week, our new champion. Thank you, guys. Another star-packed week gone by. Another entertainment spectacle lies ahead. It's all on the way to the million-and-a-half-dollar finals. Until next time, good night from the Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, and Star Search 93, the world's greatest talent competition. <laughs> Over you, love. The waves come in, the guys go up. Ah! Ah! you get here, just get here if you can.
me, turn me on, and burn me down. At Wiley's, we're different. I wear for every occasion and hundreds of styles to choose from for a night on the town. Out on the slope, the career look. Whether out on the range or out on the hunt, Wiley glasses go everywhere. At Wiley's, we are different. We're locally owned, we accept most insurances and Medicare, because at Wiley's, the most important person is you. Come see us. If you're a man, or there's a man in your life who has a drinking or other drug problem, contact the Harold Hughes Men's Recovery Center. We can help. This month, Channel 5, Hardy's Restaurants, and Caldwell Banker, Mid-America Group Realty are teaming up to provide coats for needy folks in our state. As you care for your children's needs this fall, think about Iowa's less fortunate families and what a warm coat could mean to them. If you'd like to help, all you need to do is drop off your donation at any of these locations. The coats you donate will be cleaned and distributed to Iowa families free of charge. Channel 5's Keep a Kid Warm program is designed to help these families through the winter months. We hope you'll want to help too. There's no way that I would have been accepted with um, a white woman as my lover. Gay interracial relationships next on a huge Monday at 9 on Channel 5. Mostly cloudy and cool this evening with a few sprinkles possible. With Ross Perot. Tonight, part one the early years. Now here is Murphy Martin. Good evening and welcome to a conversation with Ross Perot. Ross, where did you grow up? I was born and grew up in Texarkana, Texas. It's on the Texas-Arkansas border. Lived five blocks from the Arkansas line. How did your parents wind up in Texarkana? My mother uh, lived there. She had graduated from high school. My dad lived in New Boston, 20 miles away. His dad had passed away when he was 14. He had to drop out of high school, worked as a cowboy. Then he became a cotton broker. He met my mother uh, at a dance on sort of a blind date, and the rest is history. Tell me how you first got going in business. All of my business training was at my father's knee. I sat in his office and watched him deal with the farmers as a cotton broker. His philosophy was, treat them fairly, treat them right and you can do business with them year after year after year. Some of the happiest memories of my childhood are riding with him down to the farms, over the dirt roads, into these little houses where people live very modestly, visiting with them off season to keep their friendship, keep their, let him, the farmer know that my father was interested in his business the next year. But the thing that he practiced was fairness. He would give them a fair price. Some of the other brokers would try to take advantage of them, and as a result, Typically, he got the first opportunity to buy their cotton. Then he would let me go with him to the horse auctions and the cattle auctions on Friday. First, he would let me buy and sell bridles, but I couldn't keep a bridle. I'd have to buy one for $3, sell it for three fifty, sell it for $4. I was what you call a day trader. Then when I got pretty good at that, he let me buy saddles, and I could do the same thing. Then when I got pretty good at that, he would let me buy calves, but I couldn't take anything home. And then finally he was letting me buy individual horses and individual cattle, but I could never take anything home. Now, those are marvelous lessons, and he would sort of stand in the background and smile and coach me. So that's how I learned business at my father's knee. It was a wonderful way to grow up every afternoon. See, children don't have these opportunities now. From the time I was six, probably until the time I was 15, 14, he would pick me up or meet me at home typically after school and by 4.30 in the afternoon he and I were off riding somewhere for a couple of hours. He was my best friend and I had a lot of good friends but he was my best friend. Russ, tell me about your mom and I know she had a big influence on you as well. Well, no, she was a saint and nobody could have had a better mother. All her life she reached out to help other people. We lived five blocks from the railroad tracks, the dirt road from the tracks up to our house. We were in the Depression. The hobos, we'd call these homeless or street people now, we called them hobos then, would come by our house and again and again knock on the door and ask for food. Now today you'd have the doors locked, you'd be worried to death. Then you never locked the doors. There was no fear that these people would hurt you. They were just hungry. And my tiny little mother always fed them, even though we didn't really have food to give away. One day a hobo came up and ate and he said, lady, do you have a lot of people come here? And she said, yes. 
And he said, would you like to know why? And she just smiled and said, well, sure. He said, come out here and I'll show you. And right on the edge of the road was a mark. And he said, lady, you're a mark. And that mark had been put there by earlier hobos saying, you'll get free food here. He left. And I turned to my mother and I said, do you want me to get rid of that mother? And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And she says, no, son. These are people just like us. The only difference is they're down on their luck. And as I think about my parents, I realize they live their entire lives working and sacrificing so that my sister and I could have the dreams that they had that would never materialize. And all of their dreams materialized through us. So it was a beautiful way to grow up. You mentioned your sister. Was she older or younger than you? Uh, 18 months older. She was the perfect child. I lived in her, I always live in somebody's shadow. Growing up, I lived in her shadow. Every time I went to school, I was asked, why aren't you like your sister? And uh, that was, you know, I just wasn't as smart as my sister. Now, today, I live in my son's shadow, and I hope we'll, we'll talk about him later. But I guess I was destined to live in somebody's shadow. I'll tell you one last story to show you the kind of parents I had. I remember one, I was probably 10 years old. I walked in the house one day, and my mother had tears in her eyes. It was in November. And mother was very strong. She never cried. And I said, Mother, what's wrong? And she says, Your dad has sold his horse. And I said, Well, why did he sell his horse? And she said, So that you and your sister could have a Christmas. Now, he never, ever said a word to me about that. I never would have known why. But see, that's, that may be, you know, those are a lot of little stories. But uh, people have asked me over the years when I first felt rich, and I've always said, I was born rich. So you came from a family of modest means. Well, you know, it was interesting. The house we lived in cost $4,000. But that was back when a dollar was still a dollar. It was a nice little house. Uh, we always saved money. We always got by. Everybody worked when I was a child. I started to work when I was seven years old. When I say this to young people now, they feel like I must have been harshly treated. No, everybody worked. This is, we just say, you make do, and uh, you'll get by. So my first thing I ever did was break horses. Uh, I was a good horseback rider. I was lightweight because I was only seven years old. I could break them when they were young, and we could sell them earlier because they were broken and ready to go. I got paid a dollar a horse. I learned some valuable lessons there. First, and you can look at my nose and see I learned the hard way, is don't let them buck. Uh, you don't want to know how many times I was thrown until I figured that out. And the typical cure that you'd get thrown, get knocked out, and uh, put your head under a water faucet, and you'd get back on. But we learned not to let them buck, learned how to break them in a fraction of the time it originally took, and I was making pretty good money breaking horses. Then I got to selling flower seeds, garden seeds, Christmas cards, Saturday evening posts, a whole variety of things, uh, during when I was 8, 9, and 10 years old. Uh, learned wonderful things there. For example, years later after I was financially successful, I was riding up a chairlift in Vail, Colorado. The owner turned to me and said, Ross, would you like to buy this ski resort? And I looked at him and said, no, I'm not interested. And he laughed. He said, well, it didn't take you long to make that decision. And I said, I learned when I was eight years old not to get in a seasonal business. He said, what do you mean? I said, I sold Christmas cards. It was terrific till after Christmas, and then there was nothing to do. You had to get in a new business. He laughed, told that story all over the country. So you learn these valuable lessons. And you had a paper route as well, didn't you? I had several. My first route was a morning route on the Arkansas side, and it was just middle class. My second route was an afternoon route downtown. Again, see, none of this was planned, but it's such a wonderful education. I started off first through papers to the bankers and the lawyers in the bank building. Then I worked my way on down Main Street to the small store owners. Then I got on further down Main Street and delivered papers to the houses of prostitution, which my mother was not very happy about. Then I turned the corner and delivered a paper to the Catholic priest. Then I went a half block and turned left, and I delivered newspapers to the black doctors and dentists, the black professionals in the Depression. These are people who had overcome unbelievable odds to get a college education. Then I came back up, delivered papers to a feed and seed store, and that was my route. Then the next summer, I couldn't get a route. 
So I was really hustling to get a route. This is when you look for work. Jobs didn't come to you. And the only paper out available was in the poorest section of Texarkana, Newtown and Avondale. Avondale had the poorest whites, Newtown adjoined it, had the poorest blacks. The general feeling was nobody could read, nobody would want the paper. The paper reversed the rate. Normally you got, the paper boy got, you collected a quarter. The paper boy got seven and a half cents. The newspaper got 17 and a half cents. They reversed it because I had to ride a horse because it was sand road, you couldn't ride a bicycle. And they figured it wouldn't work anyhow. I went around and knocked door to door and almost all these people wanted the paper. Now it's amazing. With luck, they were making $9 a week, but they wanted the newspaper. So I delivered the paper out there at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and everybody else was afraid to go into the neighborhood. Nobody ever tried to harm me. It was just, these were very poor people, but they were kind, gentle, good people. No problem. We, uh, we so I delivered the newspaper there, and one of my most vivid childhood memories after we got the route started, well, I really had two. One is they tried to change the rate on me. So I went to the publisher. I learned a lesson here, go to the top. A week before they tried to change the rate, the publisher, Mr. C.E. Palmer, who was a wealthy man in the Depression, had newspapers all up through Arkansas and Little Rock, and radio stations. I mean, he was a big success. He'd locked himself in his office. It was noon, I happened to be in the newspaper Heard him banging on the door, went over and let him out. A week later, they tried to reverse my rate because I was making too much money. But I had created the route out of nothing. So I went in to see Mr. Palmer. I said, Mr. Palmer, do you remember me? He says, yeah, you're the boy that let me out the other day. And I said, that's right. And I said, I had a contract with your paper and you've reneged on it. And he looked at me and just broke up. Here's this 13-year-old boy talking to him politely, but just saying you broke your deal. He said, well, what's the deal we had? And I explained it to him. And he said, and why did we change it? I said, because I made the route successful. And he says, son, I'll look into it. Well, of course, I kept my rate because he was a man of his word. That's a lesson I learned. But the sweetest lesson I learned, my dad had to have a kidney operation. And this was like brain surgery it would be today. Uh, we were very close. This was going to exhaust our financial resources, to say the least. That was not a problem. Uh, we, you know, we would have borrowed, sold, given away everything we had. That's the way you did it. But you couldn't do it in Texas County. We had to go to Shreveport, Louisiana, 74 miles away. Nobody else would throw the newspaper out for me. Thought it was too dangerous. I went to my customers, knocked on the door, explained my situation, said, I'll be back in a few days. I hope you'll keep taking the paper. Almost 100% of them said, son, save the papers and deliver them when you get back. And I said, but you don't want old newspapers. And they said, that's not the point. If your dad is having a kidney operation in Shreveport, you need the money. Now, these are people making $9 a week. Now, I learned a lot about the goodness of poor people through that experience, and I carry that with me for the rest of my life. I was in Newtown not too long ago. Uh, interesting enough, I was there with Barbara Walters. An older man came out, looked at me, recognized me, from the television, you know, from having seen me on television, started laughing. He says, there's my paper boy. And we had a lot of fun talking together. Went through a General Motors plant in Arlington. One of the factory workers looked up and started laughing. He says, there's my paper boy. So uh, I have I had great memories. and It was a wonderful experience. And I learned a lot, Murphy, that I carry with me for the rest of my life. Ross, can you remember the first time that you spoke and people paid attention to what you said? Well, that's a tough one. Probably, well, my earliest recollection, I was president of the student council at Texas County Junior College. 200 students. The decision had been made by the, the, the board of the college to expand the college into one square, square block right across the street. The students and most of the teachers and professors felt like the college should be relocated so that it could grow. Now, I was 18 years old, and students didn't have much status back in those days, but my parents had taught me to always stand on principle, and this is the first time I planted both feet, but in a very tactful, respectful way as president of the student council, I went to the board and told them we thought they were making a mistake. They should relocate the college 
to a campus where it had a number of acres and could grow and expand. To say that this created tension is an understatement. I had a wonderful professor, Claude Pinkerton, who was our student council advisor, who said, Ross, you're doing the right thing, stand on principle. My parents were saying, son, you're doing the right thing, stand on principle. The other students were saying, do the right thing, stand on principle. I stood there and got my head torn off repeatedly, but that's the bad news. But see, I learned then it doesn't matter what happens to you. What matters is did you do the right thing? Today, that college is on a 100-acre campus. The last time I checked, it has over 5,000 students, not 200 anymore, and is a part of the University of Texas system and is a tremendous resource to that part of Texas. Thank goodness we got it moved. It was worth the headaches and pain. When did you first know that you wanted to attend the Naval Academy? Now, there was a fellow two blocks away from me that I really admired, but I didn't have much contact with him, named Josh Morris, Jr. He went to the Naval Academy, and at that point, I knew I wanted to go, even though I had never seen the ocean or never seen a ship. He told me about it, and I knew I wanted to go. But your appointment was not an immediate one, was it? Well, I had the dream, and we started uh, filling out all the forms, but we did not have any political influence. So I'd started my early my senior year, didn't get in high school, didn't get it. Tried my freshman year in college, didn't get it. And in March or April of my second year in junior college, one day out of the blue, we got a telegram. If you walk into my office today, that telegram is there framed. It changed my life. And I had a principal appointment at the United States Naval Academy. Well, that was it. I went in June. I was sworn in on June the 27th, my 19th birthday, and uh, the re I had, now again, see, I had had the reverse of a military upbringing. I was free to wander around in this little town, but not totally free because everybody knew my folks and everybody knew me, and if I did anything wrong, they would call my parents immediately. Wouldn't you love to be able to recreate that today in our country? I didn't know this until years later. And this is a story that was told to me. I, I don't know if it's true or not. It's an interesting story. I assume it is. After EDS was a success, a man called me and said, Ross, didn't you ever wonder how you got an appointment to the Naval Academy? And I said, yes, I have, but I sure wasn't going to ask at the time. He laughed. He said, look, I was a senator's aide. We were cleaning up his office, and I said, Senator, you have an unfilled appointment to the Naval Academy. And the senator said, does anybody want it? And I said to the senator, well, we have this boy from Texarkana that's been trying to get one for three years. And the senator said, just give it to him. Now, see, that's pretty good luck. Now, I've been lucky all my life. I can tell you luck stories till, you know, the world goes flat. But that was a great piece of luck to be able to go to the Naval Academy and have that wonderful opportunity. Got in the Navy, this was my chance, among other things, to see the world. But first, to meet people from all 50 states. It was fascinating. And these were great guys. These were all people, again, most of them more talented than I, because of the selection criteria at the Naval Academy. So they were a great source of inspiration. We had people from the Philippines, people from South America. It was a, quite a group of people. That was impact number one. Impact number two was uh, the education. The quality of the education was terrific. So I really got a good engineering education. But now a funny thing happened at the end of my first year. They measured your leadership skills in this way. Your classmates, the upperclassmen, the military officers, and the academic officers all evaluated you. And then one day they posted them on a bulletin board. And I stood right at the top of my class. Now I was 20 years old, or 19, going on 20. And I remember looking at that, and it was like finding out you could play the piano by ear. Nobody had ever used the word leadership around me. I'd been president of the student council, this, that, and the other. But it was literally saying, gee, this is something I can do. And that evaluation then took place three times a year. And again and again and again, my peers, my upperclassmen, the military officers and the academic officers ranked me at the top. And then we were taught leadership. I got a wonderful engineering education, but the greatest thing that happened to me at the Naval Academy is I was taught leadership. Then I got to practice those principles as a young Naval officer. 
my junior and senior year, the midshipman uh, honored me by electing me as president of the class. Uh, I was elected lifetime president of my class, a senior year. It took a lot of ribbon about that. Uh, I was chairman of the honor committee. And then again, one more time, before I got out, of, you know, had this experience in Texarkana, we, as chairman of the honor committee, we had a midshipman that had done something that was absolutely improper. All the midshipmen on the honor committee felt he should be dismissed. He came from a prominent family. There was tremendous political pressure not to dismiss him. A tentative decision was made to overlook it. Well, here I am at this point, 22 years old, just about to be 23. I resign as class president and chairman of the honor committee as a matter of principle. Now, God bless Admiral Joy, who negotiated the Korean truce. He called me over to his office. He was an, old, an older man, even as an admiral. And I sat there, he invited me to sit down. And he said, now son, tell me why you're resigning. And I just spelled it out to him. And as I got into it, he started to smile. Because see, we had been taught, when honor is involved, be deaf to expediency. That had been taught and just burned into our souls at the Naval Academy. And when I finished, he looked at me and smiled, he says, I'll take care of it, you're right. He took care of it. So justice, try, the fair thing was done, otherwise we would have wrecked the whole honor system. So again, you know, I, I took a beating on that, but I learned again a second time, uh, standing up for what you believe is worthwhile and just take the heat that goes with it. Russell, I know your parents were awfully proud of you at the academy, especially your father. Uh, there's no way to express how much it meant to him to be there the day I graduated. It was a tremendous sacrifice. They drove from Texarkana to Annapolis in their 49 Plymouth, and just, it was one of, I'm sure, one of the big moments of his life in that he got to live his dream through me, and he got to live it through my sister. And, but he was a very interesting man. Uh, we wanted to take him to New York because we were fairly close to New York, he agreed to go. We spent a day there, and he says, well, I've seen it now. And he wanted to get back to Texas. You also had an opportunity to go right into active duty after graduation. What was that like? I had an opportunity to get a ship that was going around the world. Now, one thing I need to tell you is I had met Margot on a blind date on October the 18th, 1952. That's almost exactly 40 years ago. I fell in love immediately. It took me four years to win her over and get her to marry me, though, so we have to go out to 1956. But even though I was really smitten with Margot, I was absolutely attracted to this cruise around the world to Korea. The truce had been negotiated, but not signed. Admiral Joy negotiated it, but it had not yet been signed, and there was a chance the conflict would start again. So we went straight to Korea. I reported aboard the USS Sigourney, a destroyer, Again, on my 23rd birthday at 2 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, we got underway to go around the world. Had a great captain, Captain Lionheart, a great executive officer, uh, Cap uh, Commander Stock, and we had a terrific adventure. Now, as junior officer, I got all the bad jobs. And since we were gone nine months, there were no new junior officers. So I was stuck as junior officer. Uh, I got shore patrol every time we went ashore. That was an education. Uh, the, uh, I was in, oh, as I was Protestant chaplain, we got all the way to Midway Island before the truce was declared. Now, every Sunday, we packed the fantail when we had religious services. They were coming to church on Sunday. We were going into combat. We got to Midway Island, they declared a truce, and I realized I was not Billy Graham after that. So my, my, my uh, chaplain skills were basically a function and my ability to teach first aid and damage control. But I will never forget that experience. 17 seas and oceans, uh, 22 foreign countries. Uh, I have enough stories to last a lifetime from that. Great experience, great, great people. The crew, the enlisted man crew were all products of the depression. These guys were hard as nails. They'd come up the hard way, they'd never had any breaks. But I, they were so bright, so literate, and so articulate. The only difference was I had gotten the breaks. Ross, in the mid-50s, you married that girl that you met on a blind date back at Annapolis, didn't you? Well, finally talked 
uh, well, first off, I need to go back. We had our blind date. I was immediately in love. Uh, anybody that ever knows Margot immediately falls in love with her, men and women. She was very, very popular in Baltimore where she went to college. All the young doctors at Johns Hopkins, I had big time competition. Plus, I was gone all the time. And, uh, but at the end of the first date, she went back to her college, Goucher, and all of her friends asked her about this midshipman she had had a date with because she really didn't want to go on a blind date. She had too many options. And they haunt her with this story today. She hesitated for a minute and then said, well, he's really clean looking. So that was her first impression. Of course, all midshipmen are clean looking. Then uh, I talked her into marrying me. We married in September uh, 15th, uh, 1956. Uh, she taught school my, the year I was in the Navy. We lived in a tiny little apartment in Wickford, Rhode Island, right across from Howard Johnson's, which was good. She was learning to cook. And uh, so we'd go to Howard Johnson's. Plus, any time the ship was in port, she would like, she'd eaten the officer's mess with me, and we could go to the movie on the base for 10 cents. So it was a pretty good first year life. And you finished out your term of service on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, I finished my term of the story, went to an aircraft carrier, loved, the, well, the air, oh, it was like heaven. It was because you had an adequate place to sleep, you had a nice place to eat, it was a huge thing. The last part of my term on the Leyte, my job as assistant navigator was to live on the bridge with the captain. And it was fascinating. We'd have a screen of nine destroyers around us. We'd have uh, tankers to refuel us. We'd have replenishment ships to bring food in, so on and so forth, and submarines underneath us, and airplanes landing and launching night and day. I knew how to do that. That's all I knew how to do. Now let's go back to luck again. Okay, I was real lucky to get that appointment. I was really lucky to meet Margo on a blind date. Now then, suddenly we have an IBM executive come aboard as a guest of the Secretary of the Navy for a one-week cruise. He's on the bridge all the time. I'm on the bridge all the time. See, he knew how to do a lot of things, but he didn't know how to do the one thing I knew how to do, and so he found it interesting. So one day he said, the captain mentioned to him casually that I was getting out of the Navy. And he said to the captain, would you mind if I talked to him? And the captain said, no, he's leaving the Navy. And he came over and said, son, how would you like a job with IBM? Now, I'm embarrassed to tell this story. But I looked him in the eye and said, Mister, I'm 27 years old. I have worked since I was seven years old. I always had to look for work. And this is the first time in my life anybody has ever offered me a job. And I said, you bet I'd like to talk to you about going to work for your company. And here's the terrible part. And I said, I don't even know what you do. Well, I went to work for IBM, had a great five-year adventure. Uh, working with IBM in the early days of the computer business. We drove to Dallas, had our 52 Plymouth. It's now 1957. We found a small apartment. Everything we owned was in the back of our car. Now, this is important because we were just as happy then as we are today. See, tangible things don't bring happiness. We were happy then, we are happy now. And you were phenomenally successful. A whole lot has been written about my sales record, and it's been overblown dramatically. All I did is work hard all day, every day. Most of my pals worked about a half day because there was such a demand for computers. I worked all day, every day, and it was fun, and boy, did I learn a lot. And the most important thing I learned were those great principles of Tom Watson Sr. in terms of how you deal, treat your people. The customer is king. Those fundamental things that are the hallmark of all my businesses came right from that IBM training and right from my dad's office dealing with the farmers. Thank you, Ross, and thanks to all of you. That's all the time we have for this evening, but we hope you will join us again when we will pick up the Ross Perot story with the beginning of his business success. And mark your calendars for Election Day. That's November 3rd. Good night. Check your local listings for part two of our conversation with Ross Perot. Now, due to the overwhelming response to last night's broadcast on Ross Perot's solutions to our economic problems and government reform, we will rebroadcast that program immediately following this unique real-life story about a very special gift.
Dear Ross, I was awarded this Purple Heart for wounds received during a Vietnam ambush. Over the years, its value to me has grown significantly. And like my family, it is priceless. I would be honored if you would accept the loan of my Purple Heart to keep with you throughout the campaign. I believe that it can serve as a compelling reminder that the hard battle ahead can and must be won. Let it also remind you of the army of ordinary citizens that is mustered to your call and looks to you to stop the hemorrhaging of the American spirit and to restore honesty, integrity, and responsibility to our government. Like you, I firmly believe that if we stand united, we will win. Good luck, Ross. Ross Perot's Solutions, balancing the budget and reforming government. Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about how to solve the problems that we defined that face our country. I think we can come to the conclusion immediately with this quote. History repeats itself. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced the arrogance of public officials should be controlled. These are not new words. Cicero said these words over 2,000 years ago, but certainly they apply to our country today. Anytime we do anything, we try to learn from experience. We learned a lot from the first program from your comments. First, you wanted better charts that you could see the fine print on, and you'll have those tonight. Secondly, we had one news announcer criticize the pointer that I used before. So, since we're dealing with voodoo economics, a great young lady from Louisiana sent me this voodoo stick, and I will use it as my pointer tonight. And certainly it's appropriate because, as you and I know, we are in deep voodoo. Well, let's get right to work. Let's sort of do a quick summary of what we discussed before in terms of where we are, then we'll go to the solution. We're $4.1 trillion in debt. That's a staggering burden to pass to our children. It's unconscionable. Just this year, we ran up $341 billion in new debt. And as we discussed the other night, that's our legislators and our president trying to buy our vote this year with what used to be our money. We're not that dumb. Now, where does the money come from? It comes from all these places, and we get $1.1 trillion coming in the door. The two major sources are individual income tax and Social Security and Medicare. Corporate income tax is the third. The others are fairly small. How much money do we spend? We got a trillion one coming in, but we're spending a trillion five. Most of that goes to Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlements. Next to that is national defense, a little over $300 billion. Next to that is interest on the debt. That's unusually low this year because the interest rates are so low but don't count on that continuing. Every time the interest rates go up 1%, the 70% of the national debt that's five years or less goes up $28 billion. That's the impact. What is the net effect of the way our country's been run? What used to be a dollar in 1950 is now 18 cents. No wonder both parents are working, some of them two jobs, just to make ends meet. Running the value of the dollar down is really hurting the people in our country. Now let's look at the net effect on all of us. From 77 to 92, the poorest got poorer, the second poorest fifth, this is 20% of the population, still lost money. The middle fifth, the three fifths up, still lost money. When you get to the four fifths, it's break even. The richest fifth is the only place that went up. Now go to the top 5% and the top 1%. Top 5% improve their incomes by 60%. The top 1% by 138%. Trickle down economics, didn't trickle and this isn't fair. All right, what about our average hourly wage at a time when we need to have everybody at work and making more money so that we can pay our bills? Just follow it here. It's 60s, 70s, 80s, 90, it's dropping. Shouldn't surprise you, supply and demand, we've got people out of work. Well, just to show you how fouled up the system is, in the middle of all this, what's happening to our corporate executive salaries compared to those of our industrial competitors who are beating us in head-to-head -head competition. 
Here's the ratio between worker compensation and executive compensation in Japan. Here's the ratio in Europe, and here is the ratio in the United States. Trickle-down economics didn't trickle at all, folks. It all stopped right here. And that's not good for the companies, that's not good for the stockholders, that's not good for the country, and that leaves us vulnerable. The, excuse me. These guys want to make this kind of money. They ought to be TV anchormen, basketball players, uh, or rock stars. But running a company, look, these fellows have their heads straight here. They're getting appropriate income, but not rock star income. Let's look at our international competitors. Now, you don't have to like the fact that we live in a tiny world, but I'm telling you, we're stuck with it. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Here we are. Look at how they are growing. Here's our growth. Here's Japan's growth. Here are the newly industrialized Asian countries that at one time you and I thought just raised rice. They're not raising rice anymore, folks. They've got what used to be the high-paying jobs here over there. This chart makes it as clear as I can to you in terms of who is going to own tomorrow. Think of Taiwan, tiny little island. There it is, just in a little piece of Texas. They're going to spend $600 billion on public investment programs. Our great country is going to spend $150 billion, one-fourth that much. We have a population of $248 million. Taiwan has $20 million. In fact, we're over to about 12 times their population, and we're spending a fourth as much preparing for the future. All right, let's go from there to Japan. Here is Japan. Japan is about the size of Montana, if you pack it all together. It's much smaller than it appears on the map. It has a population half our size. But Japan is spending $80 billion right now on building for the future, short term. Now let's go to Germany. Keep your eye on Germany. I told you that you know, they're paying a, paying a good price for money. Germany is right here in purple. Germany has 78 million people. But Germany will spend $1 trillion over the next 10 years rebuilding East Germany. We'd better get busy and start rebuilding our great country and not just wandering around saying, well, everything will work out if we don't do anything. Does that ever happen in your life? Say, maybe the problem will go away in my life. If I ever take that attitude, the problem just grows and grows and grows. If you want to have it go away, you make it go away. Okay, here's the end result of letting our country decay like this. The 18 to 20... Four-year-old men in this country back in 1980, 18% of them made less than 12,000 a year. In 1990, it's up to 40%. With the women in 1980, 29% made less than 12,000 a year. Today, 48% make less than 12,000 a year, and it is voodoo economics. And maybe now is the time for me to wave the voodoo stick and get rid of the hex. But it'll take a lot more than that. It'll take millions of you showing up on November the 3rd to get rid of this hex. Keep in mind, the value of the dollar is going down. The number of people making less than $12,000 is going up. I don't want to bore you with this statement, but trickle down didn't trickle. It just didn't work. We have 19th century capitalism in this country. Our successful international competitors are practicing modern-day capitalism. We need to practice 21st century capitalism. We need an intelligent, supportive relationship between government and business. We need long-term thinking. We need to target the industries of the future and make sure they are here and the words made in the USA are written across them. We need to have the most rapidly growing small business society in the world because we can create more jobs more quickly there. All of this can be done, but just look at that and I think you'll conclude the way we're going is the wrong way. Here are the solutions. We're going to start with balancing the budget. We've got to cut general spending by $315 billion, business tax increases of $49 billion, other tax increases of $293 billion, entitlement reform will bring us $268 billion, spending increases to help build our country an additional $109 billion, tax decreases $62 billion, it nets out savings of $754 billion. We got a balanced budget, just like you have to balance your budget. Congressional Budget Office projection out through 98 is here. Our plan takes us down to here. That's a $754 billion deficit reduction. Do we have to do it? Of course we do. We're going to have a 10% cut in discretionary programs. We'll have 
a 5% cut in specific programs. These discretionary programs include such things as science grants, farm supports, government operations, etc., etc. Down here, we'll have a $22 billion cut in business subsidies, and we will have, over this period of time, $145 billion in interest savings just because we stopped spending so much extra money. Tax decreases, it's not all bad news. We will have a $27 billion decrease in taxes to get an investment tax credit, and that money will be spent to build new factories, buy plant and equipment, and create jobs. That money's spent right on the bullseye. Doesn't go in somebody's pocket to buy a yacht. Right over here, we're going to have a decrease here, and it's a tax credit to stimulate research and development. We call it now research and experimentation. You and I used to call it R&D. But this is to target the industries of the future and make sure that we lead and dominate in those industries. We're going to spend $10 billion in tax credits on worker training to train our people for the jobs of tomorrow. Now then, we've got to get money from institutions, from individuals, from every place there is money, invested in the treasuries of companies. Now hold that thought. Not shooting dice on Wall Street, invested in the treasuries of companies so that those companies have the money to create jobs. We will create more jobs more quickly by putting money into little companies, startup businesses, small businesses than any other way, but that is high-risk money. The investor may lose it. We've got to give the investor an incentive to put it there as opposed to buying government bonds or putting it in the bank, drawing interest in a savings account that's federally guaranteed. Believe me, this comes back again and again and again and again. And if anybody has any hesitation about it, we'll have a 30-minute program on this one because we're going to put it in the Treasury. The money will be used to build the company, to create jobs, and the tiny little money that goes into that Treasury and the tiny little bit of taxes that we don't get will be lost compared to the thousands of people that company may eventually employ, the payroll taxes they'll pay, the income taxes that company will pay. It will be a giant financial pump for our company, country. Business tax increases. We're going to improve the tax collection from foreign companies. That'll get us $21 billion. We'll reduce the business entertainment deduction. You know, kind of almost charge off anything against your income tax on entertainment now. We'll save $16 billion now. Have increase in user's fee of $12 billion. That'll bring us in $49 billion. Other tax increases. Here's one you don't like. Raise the gasoline tax. That brings us $158 billion which we'll use to rebuild our country. Every other industrialized country has a much higher tax than we're proposing. It's 10 cents additional per year for five years. So it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It just adds up over time to a maximum of 50 cents after five years. The other two candidates like to tell you it's a 50 cent tax. No, it goes on 10 cents a year. And I'll tell you more in a minute about why we have to do it. We'll have a tax increase on tobacco. We'll have an increase uh, on income tax rates for the top 4% of the population, and we'll reduce tax exemptions for the rich. For example, put a ceiling of $250,000 on mortgages that you can deduct. There will be no deduction on uh, mortgages on second homes. Let's go back to gasoline for a minute. Here's what our industrial competitors are doing. Italy collects $3.57 in taxes for every gallon of gasoline. France, three twelve. dollars Japan, $2.25, United Kingdom, $2.09, Germany, $1.99, and the United States collects $0.35. Cents. We have got to collect more taxes in this country, and this is one fair place to get it if we spend all of that money on building for the future and don't squander it on some new pork barrel program in Congress. This money will be dedicated for specific purposes. This is going to require sacrifice by all of us. It will pay huge dividends for us, our children, and our grandchildren. Now, I will be delighted if someone can come up with a better idea. If you don't like this, we've got to have a better idea. But this one right here, this gasoline tax, let's look at what it raises, $158 billion. Come up with something else that's more painless. It'll give us that. We'll drop it in a minute. Go to that. Entitlement reform. Okay, we're going to have to repeal the salary cap of $130,000 on Medicare. You stop paying after $130,000 of income, you'll have to keep it up under this new program. Medicare premiums were initially designed to pay half the cost of Medicare Part B. Now it's down to 25%. We're going to raise it up to 35%. That'll give us $38 billion. It's 
still a bargain for the people who use it. Healthcare cost containment, we can save 141 billion. You say, how sure am I? Dead sure, and I'll show you in a minute. Here, we, we will reduce COLAs for federal employees, and here we will tax the top 18% only of Social Security recipients on 85% of their income instead of 50% of their benefits. Now, this gets translated by the other two candidates as we're going to tax Social Security. Or last night, the president said we're going to cut it. No. All we're going to do, instead of taxing it at 50%, we're going to tax up to 85% and of the wealthiest. That's just the top 18%. Now, again, if you don't like that one, give me a better idea that will raise $30 billion. Now, why am I so confident that we can reduce health care spending by a dramatic amount. We're going to cut it $141 billion. All right, here's why I think so. Look at what the rest of the world spends on health care. 6% of gross national product here. Germany, 8%. Japan, 6.5%. We spend 12% and have an ineffective system. We're spending more than enough to have the world's finest health care. We rank behind 15 other nations in life expectancy and behind 22 other nations in infant mortality. We bought a front row box seat air conditioned and we didn't get to see the show. Just by cleaning this up, there's no question we can do it. We can save money, have world class health care. Where all else fails, just copy the country in a, the other part of the world that have better health care than we do at a lower cost. Spending increases. We're going to spend $46 billion extra on research and development to build for the future. We're going to spend $40 billion on infrastructure. We're going to spend $12 billion extra on education and $11 billion extra on aid to cities. That's $109 billion. All of that will stimulate jobs. It's work that has to be done. Now, I have two charts here. They're very detailed. But it takes everything I've said on these charts that are easy to read and shows you in detail how we come down to the fact that we save $750 billion by the end of this uh, cycle. So if anybody wants the detail, it's right here. It will take an hour to go through every number here, but it all adds up. Now, you remember the Wall Street Journal asked the President and Governor Clinton, after they looked at their economic plan, and said, can't either one of you folks add? This one does add up. It is real. Could it be improved? Possibly so. Are we flexible to change it and improve it? Absolutely. A better idea is all it takes. What is the litmus test that it must go through? Is it fair? Is this the best plan for the American people, right? Let's assume you put this in and six months later somebody has a better idea. We can change it. But the thing we can't do is just sit here playing Lawrence Welk music, wonderful, 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 doing nothing. We've got to start moving. Well, here's the result. Over a six-year period, We'll be down to here. We'll have a surplus in our budget. Why didn't we move more aggressively? We didn't want to disrupt the economy. Where will Governor Clinton be? Right up here. Where will President Bush be? Right up here. Just drifting along, if you will. That assumes everything goes well. Everything that I've been able to learn from studying this problem indicates to me that we need to move to do this. Then, of course, the critics during the campaign are saying, gee, if you go too hard and too fast, you might cause a more severe recession. Well, as I have pledged to use the terms of Vietnam, we will not destroy the village in an effort to save it. If common sense and the interest of the American people dictate slowing down, we'll slow down. Just use your head. But the thing you can't do is do nothing. This would be comparable to knowing you had gangrene in your toe and doing nothing and then wondering why you had to lose your whole leg. Now we have a $4 trillion debt. Let's look at this map here. Look at the purple, and let me tell you what, if we had the $4 trillion still in the bank, we could do with it. Right now it's gone. We don't have much to show for it. Worst public school systems in the industrialized world, most violent crime-ridden society, uh, and uh, mo most drug-laden society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cities in decay, but that, we know that, let's clean it up. But if we had $4 trillion, here's what you could do with it. And everything that's purple here, we could buy a $100,000 home for every family in every one of those states. We could put a $10,000 car in the garages of each of these houses. Then we could build 
1,000 $10 million libraries for 1,000 cities in these states. We could build 2,000 schools in these states costing $10 million each and have enough left over to put into a savings account and from the interest alone in that savings account, pay 40,000 nurses and 40,000 teachers an annual salary of $32,760. And finally, we'd still have enough from the interest income alone to give a $5,000 a year bonus to every family in those states. That's what $4 trillion would buy. We just can't keep throwing money out the window. And this is the year when you have a voice because you have organized to have a voice this year and your votes determine who gets into office. Make sure that whoever you vote for in the House, the Senate, and for president is absolutely committed and will handle this problem for you. We've got to reorganize our government to win the economic war. We've got to get ourselves organized for the 21st century. Step one, we've got to slash the White House cabinet and congressional staffs. Staffs don't get much done. All the action is in the field. But for example, in 1960, Congress had 6,700 staff members. Today they have 30,000. The White House had 375 in 1960 and today has 1,850. All they do is clutter up communications between the people and the leaders. We've got to change the whole organization in Washington so that people come to Washington to serve us and not to cash in. We absolutely must stop deficit spending. We've got to replace Graham Rudman with a bill that will really eliminate the tricks, the loopholes, and the improper accounting procedures. We've got to give the president line item veto to eliminate pork barrel and waste. We must eliminate PACs, political action committees, We've got to make our elected officials responsive to the people and not to the special interests. That's job one. We've got to eliminate all possibilities of special interests giving large sums of money to candidates and we must leave no loopholes. We must limit political contributions to $1,000 and no other way. Today we hold elections on Tuesday. It's hard for working people to vote. They have to go early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Let's change it and hold elections on both Saturday and Sunday. Make it easier for working people to vote. We've got to require all members of Congress and the President to turn in excess political funds from prior campaigns to the U.S. Treasury immediately after a campaign. No grandfather exemptions, no exceptions. We must make adequate television time available in equal amounts to competing candidates. We must eliminate the need to raise millions for campaigns. This corrupts our process. As a matter of principle, we must get rid of all the freebies in Congress and the White House, such as free haircuts, free gymnasiums, free prescription drugs, free ambulance service, and the list goes on forever. These people are our servants. We don't have those things. Why should they? We've got to give the voters the exclusive right to grant Congress, federal employees, and the president a pay raise. That'll keep their heads clear on who they work for. Congress has given itself a retirement plan that's worth two to three times what you and I get. We need to bring it back in line with ours. It makes no sense for the people who work for you to have a better retirement plan than you have. You wouldn't let that happen in your business. Ninety-three members of Congress under the existing pension plan have retirements greater than two million dollars. Let's just make it competitive with our pension plans. Congress absolutely must stop exempting itself from laws it imposes on us, such as the Disability Act, the Equal Opportunity Act, the Occupational Safety Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, and believe it or not, sexual harassment. Only in America would they pass laws impacting us and exclude themselves. It's hard to believe, but we've got 1,200 federal airplanes worth $2 billion that are used to fly our servants around like royalty. Get rid of them. Let them get on a commercial airline, have the same experience we have. They work for us. We must restructure our system so that the citizens who come to Washington to serve us cannot cash in as foreign lobbyists. They must stop cashing in on public service. Former federal officials elected, appointed, or career civil service should never be able to serve for lobbyists for domestic interests for five years after they leave office. Never should they be allowed to lobby for foreign countries, companies, or individuals. 
we should impose criminal penalties for violators. We must pass a law stating that former presidents, vice presidents, cabinet officers, CIA directors, the Federal Reserve chairman, Senate majority leaders and speakers of the House can never lobby for foreign countries, domestic interests, accept gratuities or fees of any kind, or cash in on their service. Our current tax system is like an old inner tube that is covered with patches. We must replace it with a new, fair, simple tax system. Above all, the new system must be fair. It must also raise the necessary revenues. It should be paperless for most Americans. You can't put another patch on the old system and make it work. First, remember Cicero's words. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of public officials should be controlled. That was true 2,000 years ago. History did repeat itself. Now that we have taken a look at some solutions, where do we go from here? If we will all make the sacrifices that I have suggested, if we will all do our fair share, what can we expect? What can our great country be? Let's look past the moment and take a quick snapshot of the future. If we take the steps I've outlined here today, we can again be a country with its spirit restored, its people back to work, and its government back in order. We can be a country where exporting cars is the rule and importing cars is the exception. I want to be around here when that happens. We can be a purposeful and thriving country, building bridges instead of building debt. We can be a country whose people are working hard at their jobs instead of working hard just to find jobs. We can be a country whose children proudly wear their school colors instead of wearing gang colors. We can be a country whose families save some of what they earn rather than spend more than they can afford. We can be a country with health care that is cost efficient and effective rather than expensive and mismanaged. We can be a country leading the way instead of a country falling behind. We can be a country where once again the diversity of our people is our greatest strength instead of division being our greatest weakness. We can be all of these things tomorrow if we will make the tough choices today. Passing the American dream to our children is vitally important to every single one of us. When I was a young man, it took less than two generations to double the standard of living in our country. Today, because of the way our country has been mismanaged, it will take 12 generations to double the standard of living of our children. Can this be fixed? Of course it can. Will it be easy? No. The sooner we start, the sooner we'll finish. But believe me, it will be a whole lot easier than a lot of the things that people did for this great country who came before us. I'll take this challenge any time to going west in a covered wagon. I'll take this challenge any time over the challenge the people had who fought the revolution and gave us our freedom. They had their lives on the line. This is just hard work. If we will do it, if we will team up, if we will make our diversity a strength instead of a weakness, if we will focus on a goal and if we won't quit until the battle is won, we can pass on the American dream to our children because we can do anything in this great country. That is the American dream. We can be anything we want to be. Now, it's going to be tough, but in the thick of it, think of all the difficult things you've done in the past in your life that you totally committed yourself to. I'll bet, in retrospect, these are some of your happiest memories. These are the things you sit around at night and talk about. Think how good we will all feel when we have these problems solved. Together, we can do it. Together, we can do anything. Thank you very much. If you would like to learn more about Ross Perot's plan to fix the economy, please read United We Stand, How We Can Take Back Our Country. Thirty years ago, people rushed home thinking the world might be coming to an end. It almost did. Khrushchev, Kennedy, Castro. We were within 24 hours or less of doing it. You'll shudder when you realize how close we came to not being around to view this program. Peter Jennings, What the World Didn't Know, next. At coast to coast, we know our stuff. 
Coast to Coast keeps the primetime bargains coming your way. This ever-ready halogen flashlight is just $7.99, a savings of up to 38%. Its halogen light is 300% brighter. It has a waterproof lens, a lifetime switch warranty, and it comes with free batteries for just $7.99. The October primetime bargains are waiting for you at Coast to Coast, your nationally known, locally owned total hardware store. This month, Channel 5, Hardy's Restaurants, and Caldwell Banker, Mid-America Group Realty are teaming up to provide coats for needy folks in our state. As you care for your children's needs this fall, think about Iowa's less fortunate families and what a warm coat could mean to them. If you'd like to help, all you need to do is drop off your donation at any of these locations. The coats you donate will be cleaned and distributed to Iowa families free of charge. Channel 5's Keep a Kid Warm program is designed to help these families through the winter months. We hope you'll want to help, too. What brought you to this place? The plus side was more than I dreamed. Are you there? Call her high. Mostly cloudy and cool this evening with a few sprinkles possible. Tuesday, October 16th, 1962. The President of the United States is told there are Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba. He convenes an emergency meeting in the White House and secretly records it.